Well, good morning, Lakeside. Uh, We're going to be in John 15, as we already read this morning. So if you want to turn to that, and I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a TV commercial or a web commercial that just nailed you? That was so dialed in to your desires and your personality that you watched it, and at the end, you just said, I want that. Well, I had one of those. And for me, it was a commercial for Michigan tourism. And I still remember it word for word. It went like this, 25,000 mornings, give or take. That's all we humans get. We spend them on the treadmill. We spend them in traffic. But if we get lucky, if we get really lucky, we spend a few of them in a place that reminds us how magical a morning can be. Make sure you spend a few of those in pure Michigan. And I saw that commercial and they had me hooked. I haven't quit thinking about that in probably 10 years since I saw it because this commercial, it had it all. It spoke to how much I love to travel, but what made it even stickier than that is that commercial spoke to my desire to have a life that matters. I wanted to think about every morning and think there goes 25,000. Did I do something with that? Now, you might think, well, that makes me sound really reflective and and really motivated. But what it really means is I have chronic FOMO. FOMO is fear of missing out. And that commercial was speaking right to it. It was exploiting the idea that I felt like I'm wasting one of my 25,000 mornings if I don't do something epic today. Preferably something that makes me go spend money in Michigan. And it worked. I've spent a lot of money in Michigan on vacation ever since then. Well, you all have that commercial too. You might be thinking of it right now. And what you want might be different than what I wanted, but what we all want is a life that matters. We all wanna look back at the years we've had and said, what did I produce during all that time? We all wanna affect the people around us. We all want to leave a mark that we've been here and done something. In other words, we all want our lives to be fruitful. And Jesus knows that about us. Why wouldn't he? He created us. He knows our nature. And in today's passage in John 15, Jesus is speaking directly to the secret to making sure the 25,000 mornings, give or take, that we all get are fruitful ones. Let's pray for guidance as we turn to the Lord today to look at what he's teaching us. Dear Lord, thank you for this passage that is just crystal clear about where our strength comes from. Help turn our hearts to you this morning. Quiet our minds that we will hear these words Jesus shared with the apostles as he's speaking them directly to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, to start, let's reset this context of where we're at in our series. John 14 through 17 is what's known as the farewell discourse. This is Jesus in the upper room talking to his disciples. This is where they have the Last Supper, and this is where he's given them final teaching and encouragement. This is Thursday of Holy Week. This is the day before Good Friday. And what we're reading here in, the, in this final, the farewell discourse, this is like Jesus' last locker room speech to his disciples. He is about to walk out of the upper room into a spring night in Jerusalem and begin to fulfill what God promised all the way back in Genesis when he said, I will send a savior to you. Jesus is 12 hours away from being on the cross as we read this passage. So what does he choose to say to his disciples here before he goes out and faces God's wrath on our behalf? our passage, this first half of John 15, Jesus makes what is the last of seven I am statements. And in verse five, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is telling his most faithful followers, you can have a fruitful life, but that happens only if you recognize that I am the only source for your life. Try to live without a connection for him, and your life will not only prove fruitless, but as it says in verses two and verse six, you will be taken away and burned if you're not connected to Jesus. So we're talking about the thing that all of us are chasing, a life of meaning a life filled with fruit, 
a life filled with fruit that actually matters in eternity. So this morning, we're gonna look at three facts about a fruitful life. Fruitful life testifies to salvation. A fruitful life is connected or centered on Christ, and a fruitful life brings ultimate joy. Now, the language of vines and fruit, it appears throughout the Old and New Testament. God's using an image these people would have seen just like this as they walk down the roads every day. So they're very familiar with it. And Jesus is drawing on two fundamental facts about vines here. Number one is a branch can't produce fruit if it's not connected to the vine. And secondly, a branch connected to the vine inevitably produces fruit. It will happen if you're connected to the vine. Now this analogy, it's loaded with implications for all of us here today. And it starts in John 15, verse three. Jesus says, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now that is directly tied to something else that already happened in the upper room. In John 13, we get the scene where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And Peter, who is always the one that wants to dial it up a notch, he says to Jesus, not just my feet, but my head and my body also. And Jesus responds to him in John 13, 10, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. What Jesus is saying there is, I don't need to wash all of you because you are already a follower of me. You have already expressed your complete faith in the fact that I am the son of God, that I am the savior. So he says, I'm only washing your feet to symbolize we're doing daily cleansing of the sin that just clings to you as you pass through the world. But you're already a follower of mine. So here in 15.3, when he says a similar phrase, already you are clean, that means I am talking to people who believe in me, just to be clear. So any concept of a fruitful life starts right there. Are you connected to Jesus through faith in him alone? Are you already believing he is the son of God? He is the only one that can pay the price for your sin and let you reach God's presence. In one of the other I am statements, John 14, six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And that's where all the other philosophies in the world get it wrong. All the other religions get it wrong. Not according to me, not according to Lakeside Fellowship, but according to Jesus himself. No connection to Jesus, no fruitful life. No eternal life. It's not just a metaphor when he says in verse 15, six, that if you're not connected to him, you'll be cut off and burned. That is a guarantee of what your eternal destiny will be if you're not connected to Jesus. And as you think about Jesus saying that, when he says those who are not connected will be cut off and burned, it's easy to think of him looking around that room and his eyes landing on Judas Iscariot and looking at a man who had followed Jesus around for years, who had heard all of Jesus' teaching, who pretended to be a follower of him, but was not a true follower. That is who Jesus is talking to. Verse six is saying, if you put your faith in anything other than Jesus, you will wither in this life and you will burn in the next one. Now there's a lot of people throwing Jesus' name around, saying they're a follower of Jesus Christ. I just got back from South Africa. 85% of South Africans say they're a Christian. While I was there, I met a, a pastor from Jones County, Mississippi. You can imagine the accent on this guy. He was telling me about Jones County. It has 67,000 people. That's roughly the population of Ankeny and Polk City combined. And Jones County has 300 churches. We have 45, roughly, in Polk City and Ankeny. So you look at these two places. So you've got all these churches, all these professing Christians. So South Africa and Jones County, Mississippi, should be totally free of any kind of social problems, right? They're loaded with professing Christians. They're swimming in people who claim to be followers of Christ. No crime there, no substance abuse, no assault, not so so what's the disconnect in those places? A human branch connected to the vine of Jesus inevitably will produce fruit. Jesus promises it right here. So what's the problem in a place like that that has all these professing Christians? Well, it's just like when you follow the power cord back from a device that's not working and you're like asking, is this thing actually even plugged in? That's what we have to do. And we're not just judging South Africa and Jones County, Mississippi. 
we have to turn that light on ourselves and say, do I see the result or not? And if not, I'd better follow the cord back and see if I'm truly connected. Now, am I really saying that there are a lot of people who profess to be Christians who are fooling themselves? That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus is saying when he talks about branches that aren't connected to the vine. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 13 when he gives the parable of the sower and he talks about seeds that spring up and appear to be alive and then wither and die because they're not true followers. This is what James talks about, the book of James chapter 2. Verses 19 through 20, James says, you believe that God is one, meaning you believe in one God. And he says, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is dead? James is not saying that your works will save you. What James is saying is recognizing sound doctrine isn't enough. A person who has truly put their faith in Christ will see their life transformed into something new. The Bible is clear on this. Your actions do not earn your salvation, but your actions absolutely give evidence of your salvation. This is a heavy one to let sink in. If there's no fruit in my life, then I'd better be very concerned about whether I'm a true follower of Jesus Christ or not. And that means we better define what is this fruit? What are we talking about? What are we looking for in a life? And fortunately, scripture gives us a very clear list, helpfully labeled the fruit of the spirit. Galatians chapter five, verses 22 through 23. The apostle Paul writing here, he says, this is the fruit we're looking for in a life filled with the spirit. You probably know these well. You may have a piece of artwork in your home with this list on it. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. If you want to know whether you're truly connected to Jesus, ask, do I see evidence of these things in my life? Now, a lot of people misread that list. They look at that and think, these are things I need to do to be a Christian. But look what Paul calls it, the fruit of the Spirit. These are things the Holy Spirit is gonna be doing through you if you're a Christian. That's what Jesus is talking about in John 15. If you're connected to the vine, these things will show up in your life. Do you see these traits in your life? Now, I don't mean in the sense that you're perfect. None of us are. We still live in the flesh. We're still living on this side of heaven. But what you should be asking is, do these traits characterize my life? Is that mostly typical? of me, or is your life more characterized by another list right before that? Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul, look how he sets this up. He just called that list the fruit of the spirit. Here he says the works of the flesh, the works, meaning when your flesh does its thing, this is what comes out. Contrast that with the fruit of the spirit. And as you skim that list, don't just look at the really nasty ones and say, oh, I don't have that problem. Not a lot of sorcery going on in my household these days. I'm good. Instead, let your eyes land on works of the flesh like strife and jealousy, envy, rivalry and dissension. These are the things that creep into lives that aren't transformed. And I'm not saying this is a list you use to judge other people. I'm not doing that. I'm saying we use these two lists to look at the pattern of our own life to give us evidence of whether the spirit is actually at work in us because we're connected to Jesus. And we use this list, if we look at someone else's life, not to judge them, but to go to them in love and say, this person needs the gospel. They're saying the right things, but I don't see it in their life. I need to keep telling them about saving faith in Jesus Christ. It is disheartening how many Christians are just angry right now? It's discouraging how many Christians are selfish, how easily discouraged they're getting. Things don't go their way. We have to look constantly at the fruit in our lives and say, does this look like someone with a transformed heart because of faith in Christ? As we look at our lives, we have to be really careful about mistaking fruit that's around us for fruit that's coming from our lives. It's easy to get fooled on that. It's easy to even fool me. 
I get to come to work at a church every day. I am surrounded by godly people doing great things for God. But I have to look and say, is that just coming from everybody else's life or is it coming from mine? Am I seeing that produce in my life? Several years ago, my family went to a farm just outside of Ankeny to get pumpkins with the kids. We pull in and we realize their pumpkin patch looks like this. It's actually a mowed field that somebody's driven around in a truck and just set a bunch of pumpkins out, which is like the most Ankeny thing ever, by the way, <laughs> uh, except for the fact that we have a Starbucks in the parking lot of another Starbucks over at Target. <laughs> so you look at this and there's fruit all over that field, but none of it grew there. None of it came from that field. If you go to a real pumpkin patch, they're pretty unruly and messy, aren't they? But if I go to a real pumpkin patch and I pick up that fruit, I can see there is the branch. I can follow it back and say, there's the vine. That's where it grew. There's evidence that it came from that. Is your life producing the fruit of the Spirit? Or are you just standing in a field of other people producing fruit? If you're at Lakeside, praise the Lord for what's happening here. But don't be fooled in thinking what others are doing is necessarily what you're doing. Is anybody getting nervous yet? Are you thinking, well, I prayed a prayer at one point in my life and I asked Jesus in my heart, but am I really following him in true faith? I do okay, but it's not like I'm some kind of super Christian. Well, first, I'm not gonna apologize for making you ask yourself this. It's critical for every professing follower of Jesus to confirm that their life backs up what their mouth is saying. James 1, back in the book of James, 1, 22 through 24, James says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and does not a doer, he's like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. He looks at himself, he goes, away and he immediately forgets what kind of man he was. We have to evaluate our actions to make sure they're consistent with what a Christian's life should be. And it's normal for a Christian to ask themselves this question. I don't know a true Christian who hasn't at some point in their life said, let me just evaluate, am I a true follower of Christ based on what I see in my life? I also want to encourage you, keep it simple. When you do a check on the truth of your salvation testimony, Ask yourself the basics. Do I truly believe Jesus is the son of God? Do I truly believe I cannot get to heaven and be in the presence of God unless I trust in what Jesus did on the cross? And then ask yourself, do I feel a need to read the Bible? Do I feel the need to pray? Do I want to be around other Christians? Those are all indications of a transformed heart. Those are all indications of a branch connected to the vine. Next, a fruitful life centers on Christ. John 15, Jesus is describing this connection as abiding. You're gonna see that word 10 times in this passage. And anytime we see a word that often, we need to unpack it and make sure we understand what it means. The original Greek word behind abiding is meno, M-E-N-O. And we read the English Standard Version here. Um, but other translations often translate that as remain rather than abide. And I think that might be a better way to put it. So every time you see the word abide, think remain. And elsewhere in the New Testament, this word remain, you know, has a really physical aspect to it. It describes going into someone's house and not just stopping in to visit, but to sitting down, to fellowshipping with them, having a relationship with someone. In Mark chapter 14, verse 34, we see another sense of this word. This is what's about to happen. In John 15, he's in the, the upper room. He's about to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark 14, 34, Jesus is praying in the garden. He says this to his disciples. My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch. He's asking his disciples, stay with me. Don't leave. Stay faithful. Stand fast, stick with me until the end. So when Jesus says, abide in me, remain in me, mino in me, he is telling us, have a deep, stable relationship with me and with God through me. Jesus is not calling us to check a box by saying a prayer 
and then getting back to whatever it is we wanted to do. He's calling us to committing to living in union with him. You cannot separate a fruitful life from a close bond with Christ. A pastor named Harry Reader said this, saving faith is not the act of a moment, it's the acquisition of a lifestyle. You live different when you've been changed by connecting to Christ. History shows us any attempt to reform a society or reform people without the gospel underneath it is going to fail. South Africa, they've been trying to rebuild a society for 30 years over there. For decades, they lived under apartheid where there was uh, violence and discrimination and cruelty on racial lines. And they've been trying to create a better world ever since that ended. And there's a lot of people in South Africa, just like in the United States, saying, you know what the answer is? More education. If we just teach people, they're going to act better, won't they? And I heard more than one person in South Africa say one of their cliches is more education just makes a smarter criminal. Education without the gospel is not the solution to humanity's problem. It's only Jesus. If you spend your life, even your well-intentioned Christian life, trying to do things on your own, you will fail. You will get frustrated. You will sit down at some point and look at your life and say, what have I been doing? Where's the fruit? Because you've been trying to do it yourself. When you feel like you lack in strength and motivation and direction, check how well connected you are to the vine. And we often, we're make, we make it seem so much harder than it is. Because I'm here to tell you, this is not rocket science. This is not brain surgery. As a friend of mine used to say, it's not rocket surgery. All we're saying is this is the day in and day out spiritual disciplines that should be in every Christian's life. Being in the word, praying, meditating, giving, fellowshipping with other believers. And we neglect that, any of those things. There's a real price to pay for it. When I got home from the South Africa trip two weeks ago, I'll be honest, the first four or five days I was home, I was not pleasant to be around. I was kind of chippy. I was impatient. I was critical. And my wife, who has a lot of the fruit of the spirit in her, was very gracious. And she said, oh, you're jet lagged. I get it. Um, you, got, you got behind on your to-do list. It's frustrating. I know how it is when you come back. <laughs> But I'm here to confess to you today, jet lag wasn't my problem. My problem was that my schedule had been a mess for about three straight weeks. I'd been overseas. I'm across seven time zones, so everything's different. We're running crazy every day, doing all these things on the missions trip. And it's not like I'm not doing spiritual things. I'm going to a pastor's conference. I'm going to church services. I'm going to gospel concerts. I'm driving down the highway having theological conversations with a brother from Nigeria. What I wasn't doing was making time every day to get alone with God, look into the word and pray. And when I let that slide, the fruit of the spirit began to shrivel in my life. And the thing about that is I knew better. I knew what would happen. I have given sermons where I quoted one of my favorite theologians who told the exact same story. He was on a team translating the Bible. He's in the word all day long doing translation and he let his devotion time slide and he said, I became a real pain to be around. So I knew that's what would happen. We can't take this for granted because I saw how important abiding is, how important Mino is. Remain in Christ. That's what staying connected to the vine looks like. You know where your strength comes from. And that strength is nothing the world's gonna give you. So what about you? If we could picture power lines dropping down from the ceiling today, connecting everybody in this room, what is it that's your power line? Or more accurately, what would I need to cut to watch you shrivel up? Would you shrivel up faster if I took your Bible away for a week or if I took social media away from you for a week? Would you shrivel up faster if I took away your Bible or I took away ESPN? Would your whole attitude go in the tank quicker if I took away your devotional time or I told you half your bank account's gone? If I took away your Bible or I took away political talk? What is that line you're counting on for your strength? 
we are promised an amazing thing in Ephesians chapter three. Look what Paul said. He's speaking about Christ. He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask, even that we think, according to the power of within us, that's the Holy Spirit, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Christ can work in you through the Spirit abundantly with a power that's greater than anything we can even imagine. That is right there. That means... If there's a lack of fruit in your life, that's not a power failure on Christ's part. That's a connection failure on your part. If your life isn't yielding fruit, check your connection to the vine. And how quickly we forget where our strength comes from. How quickly. This makes me think of the story of Samson in the Old Testament. You probably know this one from your Sunday school days. Book of Judges, Samson has supernatural strength that God has given him to fight the Philistines and do God's work, defend the people of Israel. And Samson is killing it out there until he gets a girlfriend named Delilah. And Delilah is in cahoots with the Philistines. And the Philistines go to Delilah and it's like, hey, figure out the secret to his strength so we can take it away from him. So Delilah goes to Samson. She's like, Samson, baby, where's this coming from? Where's the secret of your strength? And you know the story. He's, he makes something up. He's like, um, if you tie me up with seven fresh bowstrings, I'll be as weak as any man. So the minute he falls asleep, she goes to the Philistines. She's like, bring him in. They wrap him up in bowstrings. He wakes up. What's he do? Pops him loose. He's back. Made no difference. They'd run this drill two more times. She keeps going. So what's the secret? He lies to her two more times. Finally, she comes to him. It says in Judges 14, 16, it says she wore him down. She comes to him. She says, if you loved me, Samson, you would give me the secret of your strength. And what's he do? He tells her. He says, if you cut my hair, I will be as weak as any other man. Now, why would he do that? This is my interpretation. But I wonder if at some point in all these victories Samson's been having with all this strength, he started to wonder Is it God doing this? Maybe it's me. Maybe it's Samson doing all that stuff. And you know what? There is one way to find out. If I tell Delilah my secret, I know what she's going to do. She's done it three times already. She's going to go tell him. So he said, okay, cut my hair. And what happened? They did, and he lost his strength, and he lost his freedom, and he lost his eyesight, and ultimately he lost his life because he did not stick to the source of his strength, which had nothing to do with him and everything to do with God. That's what Jesus is warning us against in John 15. Don't try and do it on your own. I am the vine, connect to me. Finally, a fruitful life brings ultimate joy. And it's good that we're turning to this because at this point, all this abiding and remaining in Christ, it might start sounding like a lot of work. It might start sounding like drudgery that you do because you have to. But Jesus concludes this passage with a powerful positive message because the promise he gives us in 1511, he says, I've spoken these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. One of the things that flows from our connection with Jesus is joy, ultimate joy. Abiding in Christ means you're connected to God. It means you are doing what you were meant to do from the very beginning. We were created to be in fellowship with God and our sin severed that. When we put our faith in Christ and we connect to him and we stay connected to him through prayer and Bible study and the other disciplines, we are exactly what we were created to be. We are a human being who is connecting to a holy God and there's no greater joy than a human being can find. What does joy from a human standpoint look like? Getting everything you want? Having a comfortable life? Avoiding discomfort? What's joy for a Christian? being connected to Christ and fellowshipping with God. If you listen to any Bible teacher, you're going to hear them say the Bible is not just a series of disconnected stories. It is one giant storyline. And there's no better proof of that than right here in John 15. When Jesus 
walks out the door of the upper room, he is going to complete the mission that God gave him back in Genesis. He is going to bring us back into fellowship with a holy God if we put our faith in him as the only pathway to do it. So often though, Christians, we just take this fellowship with God for granted. We don't even tap into it. So often, the life of a professing Christian adds up to, I believe that Jesus can give me eternal life, but I'm not really gonna let him transform my life right now. If your Christian life is lacking joy, you probably have mixed priorities. It's probably because you're trying to follow your own way in this world while saying you believe in him to save you eternally. Theologian Don Carson said this, no one is more miserable than a Christian who for a time hedges in his obedience. He doesn't love sin enough to enjoy its pleasure anymore, but he doesn't love Christ enough to relish holiness. He perceives his rebellion as iniquitous, but obedience seems distasteful. He does not feel at home any longer in the world. His memory of his past associations prevents him from singing with the saints. He is a man most to be pitied, and he cannot forever remain ambivalent. Is that where you're stuck today? Are you a Christian who isn't quite ready to turn your whole life over to Christ's commands because sin still seems like a pretty good time? Then once more, the answer is abide in Christ. Give yourself over. Give yourself the complete pursuit of knowing him better. Joy is what awaits a truly sold out Christian. Joy so full, he says, that it pushes out everything else. You will have so much joy that it pushes out the bitterness. It pushes out the shame. It pushes out the works of the flesh because you're full of the joy of Christ. And that joy that fills your life, this is a great place to end it because abiding in Christ It's not something you shoehorn in whenever your schedule allows it. It has to be the thing. To abide in him, to find joy in him, you are going to have to create margin in your life to make that happen. I used to go to New York City a lot for work, which was awesome. I got to cross all kinds of bucket list things off my my to-do list. And one time, I wanted to go see the American Museum of Natural History. This is world class. This is a museum Teddy Roosevelt founded. This is a museum where Ben Stiller works in Night at the Museum. And I figured out if I catch a 6 a.m. flight from Des Moines to New York, I can race up there and I can spend two hours at the museum before I have to be at a work meeting. So that's what I did. Flight was on time. I race up there on the subway. I go into the museum to the coat room, chuck my luggage in there to check it, walk out in the lobby like, here I am. I'm gonna do the Museum of Natural History. The problem is that this is the largest natural history museum in the world. It has 40 galleries, 25 buildings, covers four city blocks. I got two hours and I'm gonna do this thing. So here I go. I'm racing through, I'm like, hey, there's two dinosaur skeletons fighting. Hey, there's a giant blue whale. Hey, there's the Easter Island head thing. Like, time's up, gotta move on. And I race through and I got to my meeting on time and I sit down, somebody says, did you do anything cool while you're in New York? I'm like, yeah, I did the American Museum of Natural History. Did I? I checked it off the box, but I didn't have time to really see it. I didn't have time to understand it, time to savor it. And that's what Jesus is warning us against is that mentality in John 15. To have a fruitful life, we must abide in him. That starts with admitting that you're a sinner who can find eternal life and fellowship with God only by trusting in Christ's work on the cross. And then the fruitful life looks like a lifetime of abiding daily with Jesus. Slow down. Slow down in your daily Bible reading if you have to. I'm giving you permission, okay? Just between you and me. If you fall off the pace on your annual Bible reading plan because you need to sit for one, in one passage for three days, do it. See what God is gonna show you. Quiet your mind long enough to have a conversation with God in prayer. This passage is a great place to end. Psalm 130, verses five through six. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. 
And in his word, I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. What a great place to land on a discussion about how do you make your 25,000 mornings count? It's not about the mornings, it's about who's in them. And the thing about this verse, which is such a great place to end, this was nowhere on my radar 48 hours ago. I came across this verse because in the middle of a crazy week last week, I made time and I sat down on Friday morning and I opened the word and said, Lord, show me what you want me to see. And he showed me this passage. This is exactly what we're talking about. God wants us to know him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And that happens through Jesus Christ. We just have to be willing to follow Christ truly and to make time in our lives to connect to the vine and make it a priority to stay connected to him. Let's pray. Lord, you have made a path back to yourself through Christ. We cut ourselves off from you with our sin, yet you promised in Genesis you would send a savior and then Jesus came and did it. He lived the perfect life, he died in our place, and all we have to do is trust that he paid our sin debt and we can be in your presence. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today, I'm sure there is, there are people here today who don't truly have that relationship with you yet. Maybe they haven't ever thought about it. Maybe they said a few words somewhere in their past, but they look at their life and say, there's no evidence that I'm truly following him. There's no fruit, Lord, I pray. Work on those people today. We want to share the gospel with them. We want to welcome them into fellowship with you through trust in Christ. And I pray for the believers here today, those who feel it come and go as we all do, as we get busy, we get distracted. Lord, I pray, convict all of us to make connecting with you a priority. Show us every day we need your strength that we can't do it without you. And Lord, make our joy full. You promise you will. Help us to connect to you and find that joy this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.